Hello, my name is Jackie Marchington. I'm Director of Global Operations at Cordex. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the life and times of GAP, which is the Global Alliance of Publication Professionals. Um, first of all, our disclosures. Um, as an ex-member of GAP, a retired member of GAP, um, all of our time was donated uh, free of charge. Um, ISMAP paid for the website up until the end of last year. Um, my disclosures, I'm an employee of Cordex, as I said. I'm a member of ISMAP and I'm co-chair of the ISMAP Advocacy and Outreach Committee. Um, the original cartoons in this presentation are all copyright to Cindy Hamilton, one of our ex-GAP members as well. So, GAP, BG. BG is actually before GPP. Why was GAP necessary? I just want to go through the history of uh, how we ended up being created, really. Um, back, back around the turn of the century, there are quite a, I love saying that turn of the century. There are quite a few stories breaking in the medical literature about some rather unprofessional publication practices, shall we say, around the deep publication, around um, favourably spun results, around evidence suppression, um, and around um, so basically suppression, suppression of negative results. That was in the literature. A couple of years later, the press got hold of it. And as disclosure documents came uh, available from various uh, litigations with Pfizer, with Wyeth, with Glaxo, around Vioxx and around Paxil, um, there are more and more stories coming up in the press about bad publication practices. So these were around 2004, 2005. There was substance to the accusations. There were some really bad uh, practices in those days. This is an example of a letter. The DIDA Drug, in in Industry, Docu Drug Industry Documents Archive has lots of disclosed documents from litigation. Um, this is one, a ne not a typical letter of the time, saying on behalf of drug company, Agency has been asked to assist you with the development of a manuscript. And further down it says, I've sent you a copy of the manuscript. So the manuscript is plainly already written and being sent to a prospective author to approve. Similarly, status reports, manuscripts submitted to client for review, proposed authors, proposed journal, authors obviously not involved yet. So this, 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 these accusations were founded. There were bad publication practices happening at the time. But the coverage never goes away. So this was 2008, 2009, 2010. More articles about ghostwriting, more articles about bad publication practice, um, more articles about uh, some of them from um, uh, plaintiff witness, witnesses like Adrian Few Berman, writing catchily titled uh, haunting and ghostwriting articles about industry practices. This is, so this is 2010, 2011. Then Ben Goldacre got on the scene with Bad Pharma again. Quite a lot of facts in there which were correct. The interpretation, not entirely convinced. And then Paul Thacker, who was uh, an architect of the Grassley Report in the US, actually wrote the Grassley Report, though ironically you won't actually see his name on it anywhere. Um, and this is from last week, this last article, so still going on about uh, hidden results, hidden research, corporate funding, corporate distortion of results. Throughout that period, things were happening. Um, in industry, the original good publication practice guidelines were being developed between 98 and 2003, so during the, those, those first stories breaking in, in the literature. It was revised in 2009, revised in 2013. Uh, GPP-4 hashtag is doing the rounds at the moment, so we're looking for a, potentially another revision for, I well, suppose 2019 would be the appropriate year. Um, we conducted the Global Publication Survey, which was looking at current practices in industry amongst uh, agencies and amongst publication professionals. And the MPIP now exists, which is the Medical Publishing Insights and Practices Initiative, which is a mixture of uh, industry, publishers, uh, edit journal editors, looking at best practices for full industry-funded research. So that was from within the industry. From outside the industry, the ICMJE were improving their guidelines, um, their authorship criteria, trial registration came in. Um, there are things like, uh, even, even this, this year, the data, data disclosure which guidelines have just come in. Um, corporate integrity agreements started to come through from the US, uh, kind of enforcing a, a, a companies to separate marketing from medical functions, so promotional materials from scientific exchange. And then, of course, the Sunshine Act and the FPA uh, uh, regulations are coming in about disclosing doctors' uh, payments from industry. So all these things have been happening and changing how publications are being handled and how data is being disclosed. So why do we need GAP? 
As I said earlier, around 2010 to 12, the articles coming out about ghostwriting were assuming things were exactly the same as they had been at the turn of the century, around 98, 99, 2000, um, when ghostwriting was rife and no changes had, uh, had been made. Um, articles were conflating ghostwriting with bona fide professional medical writing support, using the terms interchangeably, um, suggesting spin was commonplace and selective reporting was normal. Um, aside from saying, that's not fair, what were we doing about it? Not a huge amount. If you look at the Medline publications on these search terms, so ghostwriting, ghost authorship, you can see the ramping up of articles about those subjects going up to 2000, towards 10 to 2011. Now, this is one of Cindy's slides. We did a presentation on GAP a few years ago. This is quite typical. The top graph shows you what, what tended to happen before we were organised. So there will be uh, an article that we, we felt was reflecting unfairly on our current practices. Um, people from one of the organisations, so MWAR, AMWAR or ISMAP, may or may not see the article. They may or may not be able to craft a response. They try and put it through the, uh, the organising committee, the, the, the board of trustees, whatever, to be approved. It would get stuck. By the time approval came, if we got it at all, what was the point of resurrecting interest in the article? It was very frustrating. Um, with GAP, the idea was we would have a rapid response team who could see articles coming out straight away, craft a response, not have to go through organisational um, approval for our responses. We could get the responses out quickly and credibly. So that was the idea. So the idea was that there would be a team that could do it better. So GAP was founded, Global Alliance of Publication Professionals, uh, timely and credible responses to influential articles and be a go-to group for press um, inquiries, information inquiries, that kind of thing. I can say we never ever had a press inquiry the entire time we were active. Um, so the team was five people, members of the organisations, but not representing the organisations. So they were kind of trusted to um, act appropriately for the organisations they were members of. It had to be a passionate advocate, there was no point in doing it. And the way it worked is we took 10 weeks as lead responder, during which time if an article came up, we would draft the initial response, send it around to everybody else for approval, and then uh, and submit the correspondence or post the blog response or, or what have you. If you ever wanted to leave, it's about Hilton, California, you couldn't leave, you had to find someone to replace you. So I, for example, came in, I, I replaced Jean Snyder, uh, Serena Stretton came in to replace Karen Woolley, and then uh, Julia Donnelly came in to replace Adam Jacobs over the, uh, the entire time we were rolling. How do we find out about articles? They were referred to us, either through the contact uh, on the website, website form, um, people just emailing us because they knew who we were, um, there are various things, uh, surveillance uh, things that Search has set up, like the ghostwriting one I showed you earlier. We sometimes just chipped over articles by pure fluke. Um, and others, we kind of knew there'd be something happening. So if there was going to be a farmed out meeting, for example, or a meeting of the uh, Toronto, there's a team in T Toronto who are into sort of the legal ramifications of ghostwriting and misleading the public about drugs. So whenever they had a meeting, we always assumed that there would be something we need to res respond to. So there, there were things we could, we could look at and, and watch for, but most of it was referrals. Before I was a member of GAP, I was a GAP scout, and I actually re referred a lot of articles through to the team at that point. So what did we have to, what do we have to see in an article for us to respond to it? It had to be about ghostwriting, it had to be about publication professionals or industry practices. That was our remit. There were quite a few articles referred to us that we decided not to respond to because they may have been about, say, uh, payments to doctors or, or data disclosure. That wasn't really what we were there for. We were there for publication professionals. It had to have a decent reach. So an article we thought would have an impact either in a mainstream journal um, or from a high profile author. Or it had to give us an opportunity to educate. So either other publication professionals or early career researchers, potential authors and students. For example, we did a response to the, the Scottish Medical Students Journal. Um, tiny, tiny circulation, but a very important article and it was picked up quite well. Characters as a gap response. We always tried to be respectful um, of the other point of view. We always tried to cite third party guidance, so ICMJE, WAMI, CSC guidance and uh, definitions. We cited our sources correctly. We really read beyond the abstract. Um, that, was, that was quite an interesting, quite a lot of the, the, the articles where people have found a title or have found an abstract they thought they liked the look of, cited the article. If you actually read the article, it doesn't quite say what it meant in the abstract. Um, 
we like to refute anecdotes with evidence. So that's why it's so important to us as a team that the ISMAP research was being published about practices, uh, acceptance of um, author, author as assistance from medical writers and that kind of thing. We used the Global uh, Publication Survey. Um, we used, um, Serena did a ghostwriting prevalence meta-analysis published in BMJ to actually show the actual prevalence rather than the assumed prevalence of ghostwriting. Um, we cited the CMPP certification um, and we always tried to demonstrate current practice versus historical practice or the anecdotal practice that had been in the news stories. Um, again, highlighting current guidelines and current behaviour and not harping back on the past. Uh, and these cartoons, in case you're wondering, are the original GAP members. You can work out who, if you like. I think Adam's lost a bit of weight since then. So, what did we do? We put out around about 50 responses over the five or six years we were operating. Some were completely ignored, never seen again. Um, one led to an attempt to get us banned from the PLOS uh, commenting system, which was just before I joined. I would so love to have been part of that. Um, and then PubMed Commons was really useful to us while it lasted because it meant we could then post the ignored responses. Um, and when PubMed Commons uh, was closed, was it last year? Um, I went through and picked up all the responses that we'd done on there and added them to the website. They're all still available for people to see. Um, most of the articles we responded to were from academic journals. Um, a fair few were blogs or online comments. Uh, a couple of news stories. Um, so there you go, 50 responses. So not bad for five of us. We also proactively put some literature out there. So we contributed to the evidence, we think. The bottom one I've put a square around is my, uh, my personal favourite. Um, myth Mustang Medical Writing, Goodbye Ghosts, Hello Help. Green open access archive version of that is on the website, should you want to read it. Um, and this actually formed the basis of the ISMAP uh, myth busting session that we ran a couple of years ago, which was personally one of the most terrifying moments of my life. Um, but we did try to contribute to the evidence as well. Did it work? So continuing the searches we showed earlier, there is a significant drop off about ghostwriting articles. Um, after we gap was formed. And as Adam Jacobs, a statistician, would say, correlation does not equal causation, but I'm just saying it's, uh, it is dropping off quite nicely. So why did we decide it was time to go? So we'd done those responses. The number of responses we were doing year on year was, was dropping. The volume of articles, as I showed you, was dropping. They're still out there, but the, the focus seems to be changing now from ghostwriting, spin, uh, salami slicing, to um, data disclosure. Um, uh, all trials are taking off. Uh, there's the ICMJE data disclosure rules just changed. So it's more about things and more about clinical trial transparency, and that's not GAP's remit. Um, we only responded to four articles in the whole 2017. There's one we were thinking about in 2018, decided not to respond to. There was also what we termed the Matheson event. Um, in 2016, there were, there were three articles written by Alistair Matheson. Um, about how industry manipulates uh, CMG guidelines, um, about authorship criteria and that kind of thing. Very similar content in all three. Um, we responded to the first one, it was ignored. The second one got bogged down in comments. Um, and the third one uh, in BMJ, GAP responded to, to refute some of the arguments in that. ISMAP responded to. And there was a lot of uh, commenting back and forth. Each This only counts as one response, by the way, so I'm not skewing my stats. Um, each um, response drew a counter response from Alison Matheson. And towards the end of the process, um, GAP, sorry, yeah, yes, GAP, ISMAP, MWAR, and AMWAR all came together to craft a joint response. And we thought, well, that's what we wanted. That's what we were out, out to do in the first place. So have the organisations now got to the, the point where they can do it themselves? So we decided, as of ISMAP this year, that the one-year pilot that GAP was intended to be had lasted six years, and it was time for us to hand things over to the organisations who had already proven that they could craft a, a joint response, that they could craft a, a timely, quick joint response. They'd also just put out the um, joint position statement about medical writers uh, as well, so they're obviously work, working more closely together, and it got to the point where they could respond in a timely way. So, time to hand back responsibility to the organisations. However, a note of caution, we're not retiring because we think it's all over. We know it's not all over. There are still articles out uh, coming out about ghostwriting, about professional medical writing, conflating the two and being inaccurate. Um, so keep calm, stay vigilant. 
The website will continue to run. It will stay there as an archive of all the responses we've done, of the evidence that is available for you to use should you want to do your own responses. Um, the contact email is still being monitored if you want to report an article. Um, but I think it just, uh, I'd say at this point, thanks to everyone who's ever uh, referred an article in. Uh, thanks to all my retired Emeritus uh, GAP co-team members. And that's it. So this is GAP signing off. Thank you.